A reading from the book of Genesis, what God's spirit is saying to you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Removing his signet ring from the hand, Pharaoh put it on Joseph's hand. He arrayed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in the chariot of his second in command. And they cried out in front of him, bow the knee. Thus, he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Thus Joseph gained authority over the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh king of Egypt, and Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. Here ends the reading of the words that give us insight on God. May God grant us the wisdom and courage for interpretation. Holy God, great composer of the scores of our lives, help us to live each day, embracing each moment as an opportunity to create beautiful music that honors you. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing to you and acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was in high school, our jazz band needed trombone players. I was a freshman in high school and I played the trombone, but I couldn't fit jazz band into my schedule. As it turned out, neither could any of the other trombone players, so we decided to make jazz band a purely extracurricular activity. I mean, after all, what's a jazz band with no trombones, right? And so we started practicing in the evening and we had so much fun. So much fun that we started playing at the basketball games and then going to competitions, but the highlight of the whole year was when we went to a competition in Crested Butte, Colorado. It was a concert band competition, actually, and I think we were the only jazz band there. I don't know if we were scored, if we were in the competition or not, all I remember is that we were the last band to play before they made the place announcements. So everyone was in the room listening to our jazz band. It was one of those moments that when the conductor first put down the baton, everything just clicked. People began to play their solos, they, they played licks like they had never played before, and they would come back to the melody, and then they would hand off the solo to someone else, and then they would come back to the melody, and eventually we got to the end of the piece. We finished, and everyone in the crowd stood up and started to applaud. That was the night that I fell in love with jazz, because at that moment I recognized that we knew how the piece was going to start. We knew the melody that was going to run through the piece and we knew how it was going to end. But we had no idea what was gonna happen in between. And there was no way that we could have predicted that the solos they played would have sounded the way they did. It was in the moment. A, a creation was birthed and we experienced it all together. I think life is like that too, you know. I think our life is a lot like jazz. And to illustrate this, I want to look at one of the great lives in the Hebrew Bible, the life of Joseph. Many of you probably know the story of Joseph, or at least pieces of it. Joseph was born in Canaan. He was his father's 11th son. That means he was a part of a big family. He was also his father's favorite son, and to let him know, his father gave him a present. Do you remember what it is? A, a coat, yes. If you watch the musical, Andrew Lloyd Webber would have us believe an amazing Technicolor dream coat. 
The Hebrew says a coat with long sleeves, but regardless of the color or the length of the sleeves, the intention was clear. To show everyone that Joseph was his father's favorite son. This did not go over so well with Joseph's siblings. His relationship with them was not helped by the fact that Joseph had a tendency to have dreams and then to interpret them. So whenever he would have dreams and then tell his siblings that what it meant was that they would all be bowing down to him, they didn't respond real well to that. And so in a great family drama, they plotted to kill him. In the end, they just threw him in an empty cistern and waited for a caravan to pass by, and they sold him into slavery. Then they took that infamous coat, they rubbed goat's blood all over it, and they gave it to his father and said that he had been killed. Joseph found himself in slavery in Egypt in the Pharaoh's chief guard's home. The chief guard's name was Potiphar. Joseph quickly became Potiphar's chief servant, and then he became the superintendent of Potiphar's entire household. But then, after uh, a flirtation gone wrong with Potiphar's wife, he found himself in the slammer. He was imprisoned, and before long, he found himself in charge of the other prisoners. It turns out that Pharaoh liked to imprison people who had wronged him, and so the Pharaoh's chief baker and chief cupbearer were also in prison. The cupbearer was the person who would bring the Pharaoh his cup and, you know, drink it to make sure it wasn't poisoned. And so, as you will remember, Joseph had a knack for interpreting dreams, remember? He could interpret dreams about people bowing down to him. And so he interpreted the dream of the baker and the chief cupbearer, and at least in the chief cupbearer's case, he was going to be reinstated, and Joseph asked only one thing, that the cupbearer remember him when he was reinstated and back with Pharaoh. He didn't remember Joseph for two years until the Pharaoh had a dream that needed to be interpreted. Joseph comes back on the scene, and he interprets the Pharaoh's dream saying that there will be seven years of surplus and then seven years of famine. And the Pharaoh is incredibly grateful. So grateful that he makes him the vizier of all of Egypt, the second in charge, the most prominent position you can have without being Pharaoh. That's what we hear about in the scripture lesson today. Joseph, the 11th son who's sold into slavery, and then who is imprisoned, in a moment becomes the person who is in charge of Egypt. Isn't this an incredible turn of events? His story, of course, doesn't stop there. That famine does occur, and it's a good thing that Egypt has taken up all the grain and put it in the storehouses because the other countries have to come to Egypt, including Joseph's home country of Canaan. And Joseph's brothers come crawling to Joseph, asking for food. Joseph puts them in prison at first, then he lets them go home with some food, and then they come back and he gives them this grand feast. Then he places a silver cup in his brother Benjamin's pack and accuses him of stealing it before finally breaking down and admitting that he is their long-lost brother, which leads to reconciliation and forgiveness. I love the story about Joseph, because no one could have plotted Joseph's story, right? Who would have thought that the eleventh son born in Canaan would end up being the grand vizier of Egypt? Joseph responded to each situation in his life. He responded to his circumstances. Whenever he was enslaved, he responded to his circumstances and became the superintendent of Potiphar's household. 
Then when the circumstances changed again and he was in prison, he responded to those situations, interpreting the dreams of the prisoners. And then when an opportunity came for him to interpret the Pharaoh's dream, he became the vizier of Egypt. Greg Jones is the former dean of Duke Divinity School. And he talks about traditioned innovation and how our lives are like jazz. He says that in traditioned innovation, what we do is we learn from what has happened to us previously. We respond to, to what has happened to us before in our lives. And we respond to our situation in the moment, what is going on around us. And that allows us to innovate, to be creative. And so, he says, our lives are like jazz. Because we know we have a beginning, we have a central melody, that is, the love of God in our lives, and we have an end or an orientation towards which we are living our lives. And he suggests for Christians, that is working for the reign of God, that vision that Jesus cast of forgiveness and compassion, inclusion and justice. And so Jones says that in our lives, we must remain centered on that melody, remain oriented towards the reign of God, but within that, we can innovate. We can respond to the situations that occur in our lives, just like Joseph did. And I really like that because a lot of times what we really want our lives to be like is a great score of a symphony, don't we? I mean, we kind of want to know where things are going, and we want these, these huge uh, places where everything swells at just the right time, where all the instruments come together. And yet, we can't really predict how our lives are going to be. We can't really just follow the score the way we might want. This past year has been a pretty good example of that, hasn't it? I mean, who could have predicted that there would be a pandemic that would completely upend the way we were living our lives? And so, perhaps a better way to think about life is a bit like jazz, where we keep our center in loving God, we keep our orientation towards the reign of God, and then we respond to what's going on around us. We riff for a time, doing what's right in that moment, and then we come back to our melody. We might encounter a new situation that requires us to riff for a time on something else. And I think that this is how a life well lived often looks. A life in which we respond to the situations we are given, having our rootedness in God. This is true not just for our own lives, by the way, but also true for how we do things together as a church. So many churches want that grand symphony too. A lot of churches will spend years putting together a great strategic plan where they detail how they're going to hit just the right growth mark or how they're going to create just the right ministry. And you know what usually happens to those strategic plans? They get put on a shelf and never looked at again. Instead, Jones says that the best way to be church is to respond to the situations we're given. That when there's a need to allow a ministry to arise, whenever there's a passion uh, that comes forth in the congregation, to let a ministry arise, to let it go for a while until it's not right anymore, then to let it die and come back to the main melody. You see, that's what I, I love about jazz. You know there's going to be a beginning, you know there's a melody that you're going to riff on, and you know there will be an end. And so it is in our lives together and our lives together in faith that we are rooted in this melody of loving God and of loving neighbor. And we can let that melody sing in various ways as we riff on it together. Friends, as you begin to reclaim your lives in this world that is beginning to feel a little bit more normal every day, 
My prayer for you is that you might have a life that is a lot like jazz, where you can feel that melody of love of God singing through your soul. May it be so. Amen.